Hello, little one. How are you? On this episode of Bondi Vet. She's been hit by a car. It's a race against time to save runaway boxer Molly. Right now, she's gasping for air, and that worries me. He didn't quite pass the first time, so we're really hoping he'll do well after some extra training. A loving new home is on the line for this ex-racing greyhound. Really hope he passes, because that means he can then go out for adoption and get a new home. Oh, oh. you're so naughty. It's probably your curiosity that got you into this, wasn't it, Bella? And will this curious cat lose her broken tail? If she has a good tug on that again, it can go from a significant injury to an absolute nightmare. Come on, there's your girl. Hey, Billy. Hey, you're very special. Before she heads off to work, Mobile vet Alison is snatching a few precious moments with her rescue greyhound, Billy. Oh, I love you, Billy. I've always loved greyhounds. I've met a lot of greyhounds during my career and I've always thought that they're really placid and really gentle. And they've also got this little quirky personality. They're all individuals and they're gentle giants. And you're the best pet. The best pet in the whole wide world. Alison adopted Billy four years ago from Gap the Greyhound Adoption Program. I was actually on their website looking at the profiles of all the different greyhounds that were ready for adoption. And I remember coming across Billy's photo and the little write-up and description about him. And I just knew that he was perfect. Billy's distinctive green collar means he successfully completed the extensive training that helped rescue greyhounds transition from racing dogs to much loved family pets. All right, Billy, mummy's gonna go off to work now. You be a good boy. Okay, and I'll see you later. Alrighty. Good boy. And today, Alison is heading back to Gap headquarters to help a new batch of recruits to pass this important test. Hi, Leah. Hi, how, how are you? Going? I'm Alison. Great to see you. Leah is the Gap operations manager and will be overseeing the Greyhound's green collar assessments. So we work with the racing industry and they retire their dogs to us. So dogs that have had a career on the track and then they've retired from that or sometimes it's not for them and so they'll put them through this program to find a family, find a home for them. Weird to think that Billy was here. He's so domesticated now. Yeah. I can't even, like he's just a lounge lizard. He gets on with the kids, he gets on with all other pets. Hi Gibbs. But it's likely lounge lizard Billy started out just like this, knowing nothing else outside the world of racing. Because greyhounds generally see their kennels and they see the racetrack and the training track and their trainers, they haven't really been exposed to things that you would find in a normal household. So things like microwaves and ceiling fans and children screaming, all of those things we find in a normal household, these dogs haven't been exposed to. This is our body awareness yard. So this is where the dogs will hopefully learn that they have four feet and not yeah. just two. Teaching timid greyhounds about different surfaces is crucial to helping them adapt to family life. So we have the different surfaces. You can see that Bill here, he's working on where it's a little bit wobble rocky, cushion. wobble cushion. So often they're used to the concrete floor potentially in their kennel and the racetrack and their training tracks. But when it comes to tiles or carpet or any sort of different surface, they get a bit worried. So our staff will bring the dogs up here um, a few times a week and they'll just go over those different surfaces and we obviously reward them with food and treats and pats and things like that. Also stairs. They move the front feet as far not, as they can, not and back. then it's like they go, well, that's all I've got. It's over, yeah, over yeah. So, And then oh, he's just he's stretching, shaking. so it's about him trying to realise he's got those back feet, and then he can do it. I know with Billy, he was funny with stairs, he still right. is. He sort of does that hesitation and yeah. looks at them, so I love that you do that. And let's go. It's now time for the team 
to get down to business. This is Caesar. Very handsome dude. Not very handsome. He's going for his green collar assessment as well. Wow, Caesar. So Big day. He's Big day. Yeah. <laughs> First, Caesar will need a vet check ahead of the all-important test. Do you know if he's had any racing injuries? This will be his second attempt at getting a green collar. So Caesar had some troubles in the beginning, so he was very rough and rude and pushy. No, no. Careful, buddy. careful, careful. Caesar found it really hard to calm himself down. Caesar, come on. So we just helped them learn that. Oh, you're so naughty. After being put through some additional training, everyone's hoping Caesar will be successful this time. So it's really important for greyhounds to have that impulse control. They naturally have a high prey drive, which means they will react and fixate on small fluffy things. So what we really want with the green collar assessments is to see that none of those behaviours are displayed and the dog has their emotions in check. So we'll get started. Okay, Caesar, good luck. You're right, you got it. Caesar, you got this. Let's go. To pass the first stage of the test, Caesar must stay by Leah's side and not run away to play with medium sized dog Archie. So, watching this is quite nerve wracking. We're all holding our breath and crossing our fingers and really hope he passes because that means he can then go out for adoption and get a new home. Good job. So far, so good. So, that's really good. He wouldn't have been able to do that. Previously, he would have pulled me to the end of the lead and just about over, so he's really learnt that standing still and calm has given him the right rewards. You're a good boy. You did so well. One more to go. One down, the other to go. So it's really good to see, very, very promising. So we're off to our second test with a smaller dog and see how he goes. For the second part of the test, Caesar must resist the temptation to chase down a smaller, fluffy dog, Olive. So basically we'll do exactly the same thing with her and Caesar, but just um, maybe a little bit more challenging for some of the greyhounds when they're a bit smaller, but not you. You're gonna be a good boy, aren't you? Good boy, let's go. Good job. Oh, you're a good boy. Very good, doing a great job. This is really good to see he's off leash and he's really calm. Just ignoring Olive, which is great. Come here. You did it! You did, you did it. it! You're a good boy! So we'll be able to get him a green collar it's and green send him to a new home. He's gone through that whole program and he's really learnt the fundamentals of being calm and you know, not reacting the way he was prior. Um, he's really learnt how to take some control of his emotions, which is nice. We're very proud of you, mate. We're very proud of you. <laughs> What I really love about this program is that they don't give up on the dog. There's no time limit. And then when they're finally ready, they will get their green collar and they will become a pet. <gasps> you got your green collar. That is one of the most absolutely rewarding things about this job is that they come in and they struggle with some things and then we can assist them and we can give them the tools and then we end up with a dog that's going to make an amazing pet. It's so rewarding. I just don't know how to describe it. It's fabulous. All ready for a new home. Good boy. Looks good on you. Little star. the Bondi Clinic. Vet student Erin is carrying in a boxer who's been hit by a car in peak hour on the Bondi Expressway. What happened now? John is the Good Samaritan who's risked his own safety to rescue the hit run victim. Had she run, she would have run into the path of another vehicle, so I stopped. So he's not he's not your dog? Not mine, no. Yours? No. No? All right. Um, thank you for stopping though. That's, that's fine. In that sort of traffic, yeah. that's, that's a, yeah. a bold move. While the broken leg is horrific, Chris is more worried the boxer may have suffered a collapsed lung. Right now, she's gasping for air and that worries me. We're now getting up towards 150, 160 mils, which is a huge amount of air to have leaked out of the lung into the cavity. So 
that says that she's probably torn an airway and actually being hit by the car, and that air is now rushing out, almost hissing out into that space. She's got a pneumothorax, so even though she takes deep breaths, she just can't get that air in quickly enough. She's been hit by a car. The boxer's owner, Diana, has been desperately searching for her beloved pet. Molly was chased out of the park by another dog and was too scared to come back. I just ran and ran and screamed. If the pressure of the air around the lungs gets too high, it just squashes them and she can't breathe, she can't get the air in. That'd be the end of her. Bye-bye, Molly. Hey, bye-bye, Chris will look after you, OK? Now that Diana's arrived, Molly's saviour, John, is happy to go home. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. I'm so... Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for stopping, too. You're welcome. Very good. Chris now needs to x-ray Molly's leg and torn lung. The most amazing thing for me at the moment, though, is just the fact she's, she's just not responding to that. She doesn't seem to be in pain. She just seems as though, hey, what's, what's going on here, guys? Must be going through hell. The handy thing from this x-ray has shown that on that left side, which is what we were, we were working on before, there's no black line. So that's where I've actually done my work here. It's this right side where there's still air there. If I can suck that back out, we're a chance here. Yeah, we're just getting towards the end of it now. All I was praying for was that I find out. Well, this is a best case scenario in a series of worst case scenarios. A second set of x-rays shows Chris is winning the fight. To see her lungs looking like they're, they're fully inflating now or very close to it is, is a, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a sigh of relief and it's, it's probably the way that, that Molly feels right now too. She can actually breathe. This is a tibia coming down here. Molly's leg has been broken in two places, but she'll need to stay at the clinic for at least two days until her lungs have stabilised. I'll go home and cry now. Yeah, you've been through a lot. I think my adrenaline's wearing off. Only then will the courageous boxer be transferred to Sash for surgery. Bye, you. All right, I'll see you later. I'm going to say, I really admire Molly. The whole time she's been in here, no fear. Yeah. Okay, you've been very, very brave today, you have. It's going to catch up with her, though, and she's going to start to feel that pain and, and realise that she's got herself into a bit of strife. You leave the light on. Is that what you want? Hmm? All right, we'll check on you during the night. Not nice. Oh, sweetie. So, so brave. Three days after her accident, Molly has been transferred to Sash. Good girl. Yeah. The boxer is still in danger from her torn lung, but surgeon Andrew Marchewski can't delay her leg surgery any longer. We've obviously got to fix her fracture, but uh, her life threatening problem is the pneumothorax or the air around the lungs. A chest drain is being inserted into Molly to minimise the risk of the anaesthetic. So if there's a little tear in the lungs, we'll actually push the air through that tear and it'll leak outside the lungs and that will cause the lungs to collapse. And then suddenly she crashes and yeah, you've got to be really careful. I'm sucking air out now of the chest, yeah. That's a litre of air that we've got out of that without really trying very hard. It's a bit like Meccano doing this sort of stuff. A little bit more blood involved, but um, it's essentially Meccano. How's she going in? She's good, she's very stable. No problems with the breathing? No, she's breathing a bit more now. Right, so this is the last screw. But, um, I'm really pleased with how it's come together, to be honest. I think the leg will be 100%. I mean, it's, we've got a, two or three months of healing ahead of us. 
It's all right. Don't worry about it so much. You can put your tongue in. Go on, have a sleep. You have a sleep. It's all right. I mean, she was trying to walk on this leg when it was flopping all over the place, so I think she will, she'll run out of here. It's going to be fun keeping her quiet. Let's go down. No, 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 no. Settle, settle, settle. Good girl, good girl. Three weeks after being hit by a car, Molly is recovering well and is back in her favourite park. I know you're expecting me, but I thought I'd bring along someone that <gasps> oh probably God. wanted to come along as well. Oh, John. Hi, Diana. Hello, and John. look at Molly. And I think you yeah, remember You want to say you? hello. I'm just stoked. Just stoked. Yeah. How, how anybody could, could hit not just Molly, but any, any animal and just leave it on the road. <laughs> One more. Why not? More? I can't imagine what I'd, I'd be doing right now if anything seriously happened to Molly. I'm really grateful. I'm very, very grateful. So thank you, John. You're welcome. Big thank you from me and a huge thank you from Molly. Well, I've already got that. <laughs> Considering the state of panic that Molly would have been in, if John hadn't stopped, she would have just kept on running into the path of another car. She would have been gone. John saved her life. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. See, is that enough? I'm not, I... to, I'm not going to give you any back, though. <laughs> She wants to repay you with love. <laughs> okay. Does it hurt? Does it bell when I touch your tail? Eh? Does it? Owner Kathy is growing increasingly concerned about her two-year-old cat's broken tail. Now oh, your poor tail. <laughs> The nasty injury happened while Bella was being cared for by a family friend. We were actually on a yacht off the coast of Corsica when it happened, and I got a call from Scott's practice to say that she had obviously suffered major trauma to her tail. I don't know, I was in shock, really, because you don't really expect to be hearing that sort of news. It's been a bit sad to see her tail now just drooping down off the back of her body. She can move it a little bit. She does have a bit of control, but um, not very much. I know, Bella. It's annoying, isn't it, that I'm standing by the door and you can't open it. What? So, with no sign of improvement, it's meant Bella and her brother, Mr Lucky, have been confined to barracks. You think that can stop me? <laughs> Probably your curiosity that got you into this scrape with your tail, wasn't it, Bella? But we'll never know, will we? OK, come on then, Belle. Come on then. In you go. Good girl. Right. There you go. Now it's time to head off to see Scott to find out if Bella's tail can be saved. OK, Belle, make yourself comfortable because now we're off, OK? Big adventure, Belle. Come on then. How do you feel things have been going? She's been her usual demanding... Yeah. Uh, ..cat with attitude self, jumping all over the furniture. What kind of movement have you seen, if any? Well, she does... Uh, the last two or three days, I have noticed she can lift it a bit, then it falls down. We've still got a very floppy tail, haven't we? To actually dislocate a tail, pull two vertebrae apart, that would have really hurt and would have been done at quite some velocity. So generally it's a cat that's run, got caught in something, been run over, kept running, and the tail dislocates. What I'm gonna do is just do a quick deep pain test. Scott's checking the tail one final time for any signs that it can be saved. I'm digging my fingernail in there and there's not the greatest of response there should be really quite painful. And the fact that she isn't would suggest that there's a level of nerve loss or nerve damage. This tail, being that it's not being positioned properly, can be caught in doors, can be caught on fences, can be caught up trees. If she has a good tug on that again, it can go from a significant injury to an absolute nightmare. I do think in this instance that it is probably the best option to consider amputating the tail. So you poor little girl. Eh? If we don't 
take it off. I'll, every time she goes out, I'll probably always be worried that something's going to happen to it and happen to her because she can't control it. So that's exactly where we'll take it off right. from that point. Right. The risks of doing this procedure are that as there is a huge amount of nerves at the base of the tail there, um, you can damage their ability to do things like control anal tone. So it might be in worst case scenario that she becomes incontinent. That's the worst case scenario. I think, you know, we've just got to do it really. Not doing it to me doesn't seem like a serious option. Yeah. So you're poor little Belle. Eh? But you're going to be fine, aren't you, Belle? Because you're a tough, tough girl, aren't you? Tough yes, cookie. You are. Yeah. Sure. Bella will now be admitted to the clinic. Her momentous surgery is scheduled for tomorrow. It's funny, she's quite comfortable. Normally, she doesn't like to be held, you know, by someone who's decided to hold her. She doesn't <laughs> mind if she's decided. I know. Yeah. You're being affectionate to so, the guy about to take your tail off. Oh. Not, not a great choice. Oh. Well, <laughs> well, at least she obviously yeah. trusts me, which yeah. is nice, isn't it? Just right? There she is. Hello, Bella. You're being yeah, feisty. Hey. Doing a surgery like this on a beautiful cat, it is heartbreaking when you have to change their appearance forever. It's a real shame, but she will continue to be beautiful even when the tail's gone. So brave. But the cosmetic change in Bella is the least of Scott's concerns about the amputation. This surgical case is a difficult one because the dislocation is just so high up Bella's tail that it's so close to a little bottom and there's a huge amount of nerves around that area. And if you cut the wrong one, you can stop her feeling that back end area and you can lead to lots of problems, incontinence being one of them. And that's the last thing we need with Bella. And uh, bloody close to this poor little girl's bottom. All right, so we'll start now. She has to sever a part of the spinal cord, the bit that goes down into her tail. Obviously a, a nervous moment. Um, you want to be damn sure that you're in the right position. I know the heartbreak of this type of injury and, and when it goes badly. I had a cat through university that had a tail pull injury and sadly after two weeks he was unable to control his bladder and his bowels and he did have to get put to sleep. So there's a huge amount of nerves, there's a huge amount of risk, and I've got a few nerves as well. There we go. There we go. It's off. Yeah, sorry, sweetie. Right, let's get this closed up now, shall we? Scott's pleased with the surgery, but he won't know for a few hours yet whether Bella has sustained any nerve damage that will affect her bowel or bladder function. Kathy tells me that Bella is quite the fighter. I feel that that tenacity is really going to help get her through and go on to live a happy life. Beautiful. Even with the little tongue. <laughs> Hello, sweet darling. Are you feeling today? I know, you're not happy about that collar, are you? She's eating, she's drinking, her vitals are all within normal limits, everything that we'd expect. During the surgery, Scott had to cut through a small part of Bella's spinal cord. The danger was if she sustained any nerve damage, it could have made her incontinent. I apologise, we took your tail, we're taking your dignity slightly, good girl, good girl. So everybody's been waiting for the evidence that Bella can toilet normally. She's had a poo, which in the nursing world is thumbs up. And that means Bella is free to go home with her relieved owner, Kathy. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing? Scott. You're all right? Yes, I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. yes, very well. And so is your girl. She's uh, just through in the yes, consult room, yeah. so follow me Great. through. Hi, Belle. It's been a big adventure, hasn't it, Belle? So this is her right. oh new look goodness. back end. Oh my gosh, that looks great, doesn't it? So it doesn't see. even look like she's had surgery. So I was really amazed, very pleasantly so, to see that it all looks so 
good. I mean, it looks like it was done, you know, a couple of weeks ago. But I still think her name applies and that although yeah, she doesn't yeah. have a towel, she's still Bella. She's yes, still beautiful. she is, yeah. And but uh, it, I'm sure... She looks, looks great. I'm glad that you're happy with it because, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a strange-looking back yeah, end. but, um, I mean, her fur will grow back, won't the it? The fur will grow back. Yeah. And certainly from this cat's point of view, <laughs> yeah, she's a feisty little madam, aren't you? She is. And you're going to be absolutely yeah, fine, yeah, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Get me out of here before they take anything else off. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely feel like we've all made the right decision. Not only does Bella seem more comfortable now the tail's gone, but it means that her future is secured and now she can go out and about and enjoy the great outdoors yet again. We're all going to be happy. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. And Cathy can be sitting resplendent on her couch, sipping a nice cup of tea without a worry in the world. again yeah and one month later a confident Bella is indeed back patrolling the neighborhood come on Bella without the hazard of her broken tail she's now safe to roam as she pleases she's just loving it and she's just her confidence you know hasn't taken a dent at all there you go back in one of your favorite places aren't you She's always been a small cat with a big attitude, and she's exactly the same. I have no regrets at all, and I think if any other cat owner was in a similar situation, I don't think they'd have to worry about it. It's just nice to see them going off and having adventures. But it's nice to see them coming back safely as well. Hey, Belle. Hi, I'm Dr. Danny Dusek. If you love our show and want to see more amazing stories from the Bondi Vet team, just hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you for our next video. Hello. Come here and say hello to Uncle Timmy for a minute. Hello, little one, how are you? At the Australian Reptile Park, it's an important day for eight-month-old June. She looks great. Yeah, yeah, getting so big. The joey has been hand-raised by Tim and Keeper Julie, who've been providing round-the-clock care. It's OK, it's all right. Thankfully, she seems to be growing well. I don't get much cuter than that. She looks good, but just going to make sure, double She tip. looks great. Let's see how she weighs. What did she weigh last time? Uh, about 680. Look at her. Hello, you. That's all right. Oh, That's all right. What do you got? We got 700. 700 on the dot. Beautiful. That's great. So she's put on another 20 grams. She is oh. easily big enough for us to try and get her to take leaves. Beautiful. June's been on the milk for eight months. Now is a time naturally when she would start eating solid food, eucalyptus. But something that's very interesting with koalas is that they're not born with the digestive enzyme to be able to process eucalyptus. It's toxic to them, just as it would be to us. So what are you gonna do? So we need to get Pap, Poo, from another female that has a joey that we can feed to June. And that'll give her the enzymes to be able to digest what would otherwise be toxic eucalyptus. Yeah, true. For baby June to make a safe transition from milk to eucalyptus leaves, Tim and Julie have an unusual challenge ahead. We've got to introduce June to Pap today. And it's as difficult as it sounds, but I've got a plan. It's stakeout time. Yeah. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna sit it out. We need fresh poo uh, yeah. from a female. There's a few down there with young. We'll sit under their perches and maybe rattle their leaves, try and get them to eat, wake up and poo. And, yeah. uh, and that's what we're gonna try and feed to June to get her across that threshold from milk to leaves. Yeah. When I woke up this morning, I didn't think I'd be coming to work to come and collect the koala poo. Um, so, a little bit weird, but we'll get there. So I think we're going to need... ..some containers. Yep. Some gloves. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> let's bring June. Yeah. And let's go down and get some pap. Beautiful. Come on, you can come for a little excursion outside. 
The risk if we can't get June to eat pap and we can't make that happen is that she can't eat eucalyptus and that compromises her likelihood of surviving. We have to get this pap into her. Here we go. Okay, so we've got a few mummers here and a few mummers there. I'm gonna go and sit under mum number one there. Yeah. And how about if you pop in with the other two just here? Yeah, no problem. Jules and I are at the koala enclosure and we're here to collect poo, but not just any poo. We need the poo from females that have young at a similar age to June and are papping. Here you go. Uncle Tim. <laughs> in you go. Before eight-month-old June can be weaned off milk and begin eating gum leaves, she first has to eat a semi-digested dropping called pap. Nice and cosy. June. This is the only way the hand-reared koala's gut can get the enzymes it needs to be able to digest eucalyptus leaves. Leave a little head out for a minute. That's cute. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is difficult. We can't just turn up in the morning and find some old poo that's dehydrated overnight. It has to be fresh, as if it were when the joey was right there hanging out of the pouch and eating it. Yeah, it surprises everyone, doesn't it? Surprises <laughs> everyone. How can a koala be born without the ability to eat the only food it eats, eucalyptus? Yeah. It's crazy. Good luck. Cool. I'm going in. All right. Stay in contact. <laughs> Will do. We've identified the females that have the right size joeys, and now we're waiting for them to go to the toilet. That means we're on stakeout. We sit, we wait, we watch, and then we catch. Come on, buddy. Any day, girls. <laughs> the pap or feces that we're after doesn't have to come from June's mum. It really doesn't matter. It's a developmental stage that any female produces when they're carrying a joey. Uh, the poo turns from a hard pellet into a pasty pap. And that's made so that the joey hangs out of the pouch and actually eats it. Now, we just need that from any female to give to June to get her digestive system ticking over. How you going, Jules? Any love? No. Pretty slow going over here. What a glamorous job. Waiting for a koala to go to the toilet. Come on. Please. Hello. You gonna do a poo? Oh, I've got signs of action. Yeah? False alarm. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be here all day, aren't we, guys? Oh, I've got signs of action. Yeah? False alarm. Oh, come on. Time is a real factor here. The females only produce pap at a particular point throughout their joey's development. If we miss that window, June can't move from milk onto solid foods. It's critical that we get it. I'm sorry, Mama, I know it's not glamorous, but it's just something I've got to do. Someone's got to go sooner or later because they're very active. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Every now and then I think so close and, you know, they get up and they move around and you think this is it, but no, nah, no poo. <laughs> oh, in you get, June. Action time. Jules, hey. it's happening. Is it? Finally, I look up and there's movement. Just as I get round to the mum, I can see a pellet coming out. The container's right there and I've got it. Okay, good on you. Three, nice pap too. Thank you very much. This is perfect pap. Right colour, right consistency, right shape. We're on the money. That looks pretty good. <laughs> Liquid gold. And let's have a look if we've got here some old poo. Yeah. That's what we're looking at as normal koala poo. Yeah. Dehydrated, hard, pellety, and we've got perfect pap. Yep. Soft, mushy, palatable. What we need to do now is take June back up to the nursery and see if she's willing to eat this pap. This is a big moment. <sighs> you think she's going to eat? I hope so. Sit her there for a second. I've got two young boys, and I know what would happen if I tried to give them pap. It wouldn't end well. Hopefully, June's instincts override that, and she gets on with it. Right, June? It's very, very important that you do this. She's pulling faces. She hasn't even tasted it. She's... <laughs> what are you doing? Come on, June, you need to do this. Come on, June. She's sniffing, sniffing. Nope, I wish she'd eat it. Well, I thought I had hoped it would go a bit easier than this. Yeah. Come on, June. Very, very important for you that you take this. June really needs to eat this for her own benefit. Time is critical. If June doesn't eat it, she's in big strife. Here you go. 
June is a little princess. I put the pap near her mouth and before it even touches, she's pulling faces and her tongue's coming out of her mouth. I don't know if she's gonna eat it. So what do we do if she doesn't take this now? Well, I wish she had, but I can say I've got a plan. Can you please mix up some milk? And grab a very small bunch of the nicest leaves and I'll meet you out at Mum's Club. Yeah? It's time for plan B. Now what I'm going to do is mix some of that pap in with her milk and trick her into ingesting it. Fingers crossed it works. Good girl. She doesn't need a lot of this to do the job. Okay, so here's the milk. Yeah. And the idea is just to get a little bit on the end, just to get her drinking like she does. And hopefully, she gets a mouthful of you know what <laughs> at the same time. Come on, darling. Interested? Not sure, still smelling. Yeah. She doesn't want it to share. Little June reaches her arm out and grabs onto me. And I know exactly what that means. She's ready to drink. Hey. Look at that. <laughs> That's great. Look at the milk going down. We did it. Hey. <laughs> Plan B worked. <laughs> Plan B worked. It's an instant relief. A big weight is lifted because now she can do what all little koalas do. Eat eucalyptus. Look at her go. What uh, a champion. It's so hard not to pat her and go, good yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, let her drink, up. let her drink. <laughs> Today's a proud mum moment, really. I mean, to see her take that little next step that she needs and it's so important for her development is just so amazing. Very, very proud. Yeah, and it's not important how much milk gets in. The fact is that she's got half a pellet of pap in here with this. Yeah. And that's all the goodness she needs. Done. Look at her little milk beer. What a relief and a great success. And it won't be long before she's out in the park with koalas the same age as her in koala preschool.